like, oh. Faith in the Virgin Islands, nice. Thank you. Saul so in Oregon, nice. So we have uh, a lot of the different parts of the country re re uh, represented today. Thank you. Let's see, I want to go to our title because we are delighted today to have guests from Pennsylvania that are taking time out of uh, the beginning of school to bring you a spotlight on STEM and commitment to OER over the years in Pennsylvania. We're just uh, so delighted with uh, the activities that and resources and uh, ways that teachers are engaged that you'll hear about today. We can jump in on the agenda. We'll do a little intros. I'll give a, a quick overview of Go Open and OER, where we are today, and then pass to the Pennsylvania team to walk us through the, uh, the some of the history of Pennsylvania and OER, and um, some of the updates around STEM and science and the steel standards as they're being rolled out in the state and a chance to talk about the training that's being done and reflections, time for your questions and answers. So let's start with our introductions. Uh, I'll let each of you say hello, but so pleased to have Demetrius Roberts here today, um, special consultant to PDE for STEM, uh, multiple um, areas of study, computer science, innovative education services, and assistant and division director of teaching and learning in Chester County. And you'll hear a lot about um, the structure of Pennsylvania today in intermediate units. And uh, each of our guests today are from a different intermediate unit or IU. Tracy Rains is a virtual learning specialist from Appalachia and Rebecca or Becky Henderson from Westmoreland. So why don't you each just say hello and any other remarks. Uh, I'm Amy Evans Godwin from ISCME and also I'm leading the facilitation of the Go Open Network. So I'll pass it back to you, Demetrius. Uh I just want to say thank you for having me on. I think it's really a great time to have this conversation here in Pennsylvania and really abroad as there's so much happening right now in education. Obviously, um, AI, artificial intelligence is on the forefront of my mind as a, a tool, a reality that will be forever in the lives of our youngest learners um, and growing as a, a resource for our some of our oldest, youngers, our learners in K-12 um, and really higher ed as a whole. And so ultimately, I just think the idea of going to an open educational resource model, going open, really is something that we have to consider more and more or increasingly as students have better resources in their pockets than those are provided by textbooks or um, outdated resources that are um, in a lot of our schools and specifically those under resource schools. Um, and so teachers now have the ability to access high quality resources for free um, and work with each other to share high quality curriculum um, resources for their students. And so it's just a great opportunity to talk about um, what's happening in education um, and the impact that um, these changes are having and how we are reviewing our current rollout of not just science standards, but technology, engineering, and environmental literacy standards in Pennsylvania. So again, thank you. And I look forward to just connecting the dots as part of the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for uh, being on the forefront of where uh, STEM learning is going too. And we'll hear more about that. So Tracy, just give a hello if you like. Hi, I'm Tracy Rains. As mentioned, I'm a virtual learning specialist. Um, and I would just like to add to what Demetrius said about, you know, being able to share, use having 
OER Commons available as a platform for that has been amazing for us. It's been a great place that we can curate those resources and keep them available for everyone to view. So just a little plug there. Thank you. And Becky. Hi, everyone. I'm Becky Henderson. Um, I think for all of us, you know, Tracy Demetrius and I have been working together on this for five years now. And um, each of us individually have been working with OER in our own individual capacities a lot longer than that. But for us, it's one of the things that we like to really talk about as far as making sure that OER is not a separate initiative for educators. They don't see this as just one more thing that they have to do, um, especially in Pennsylvania, where everything is a, a local control state. So we have 500 districts. That means there's 500 different ways of doing things. We don't want this to be seen as just one more thing to do for teachers. We want them to really see how this is a new way of approaching instruction that makes sense for them and for their students. So we have been starting to talk more about open educational practices, about the ways that they can take all of this and make sure that it, it makes sense for all of their initiatives and try to, as Demetrius said, connect those dots for everything that they're doing. So we're really excited to talk with you today. Great. Thank you. And for folks that may not know ISKME, ISKME is the creator of OER Commons. And it's a digital public library of OER for materials from across the country and around the world. So it's really great that uh, Pennsylvania has already uh, also uh, been a great partner with um, ISKME, OER Commons, and Go Open. So they're just such a, a, a model um, of, of partnership and collaboration that we're excited to be highlighting today. So Go Open Network uh, is uh, being led as a, a community effort now. It started in 2015 with the Department of Education, the Office of EdTech, and in 2018, ISKME came in as a partner to facilitate it as a federal initiative. And last year, 2022, uh, it was handed off to ISME and partners and a, a group of OER advisors to begin a community-led effort where any educator as an individual can join. We welcome states and districts to be part of it, but we didn't want to have any barriers to entry. And the goal is really to build a, a network where we can share knowledge together and build this wider participation. There's some uh, new data coming out that we just heard on a, a call of, with the community of ed, open education stakeholders with the Hewlett Foundation that only about 25% of K-12 educators are aware of OER. And that compares unfavorably to in the higher ed space, about 66, two thirds of higher ed faculty and librarians are aware of OER. So it, uh, K-12, it's still an emerging movement to be hovering around 25, 28% awareness. That's not use. So that's, uh, you can imagine out there, if you're an OER user, you're really one of the stars and pioneers of this knowledge sharing effort. OER is really important for us because through open licensing, materials are free. They're always available. They're meant to be accessible for to everyone, including students and teachers with disabilities. There's meant to be no barriers to entry and to relieve the barrier of high cost and uh, the proprietary nature of materials so when, once they're modifiable and shareable, we all have access to everyone else's knowledge, educators that create improvements, that create cultural relevance, that change material to meet their students' needs. These are all really important open educational practices. And the benefits go beyond cost uh, and empowerment of teachers is one of the things that we really uh, promote that once teachers have their hands in curriculum, 
and can more easily contextualize it and customize it to meet students' needs. Teachers are more invested. They may be more able to and more willing to stay in the workforce and not leave the teaching profession. And students, when they can see themselves in their learning, are more engaged and by extension, more successful. So we're really uh, you know, excited about the potential for the K-12 landscape to take on this, um, this movement. Okay, I will pass it to the Pennsylvania team. Thanks, Amy. So as Amy said earlier, when she was introducing us, Demetrius, Tracy, and I each work for different intermediate units across the state of Pennsylvania. There are 29 intermediate units in the state of Pennsylvania. We are all under the umbrella organization, Pennsylvania Association of Intermediate Units, or PAIU, which is a nonprofit organization that really focuses on making sure that we can promote educational opportunities and collaboration across the entire state. We really serve as almost the operational arm of the Pennsylvania Department of Education because PDE doesn't always have the staff and the ability to be boots on the ground and help get into the 500 school districts that we have in the state of Pennsylvania. So we really try very hard to serve as that partner to PDE to help to make sure that we can reach to the districts immediately anytime there's a new initiative, anytime there's a new mandate. That's our main priority, working to bridge that gap between the Department of Education, what's happening at the state level, and what's happening at the district level. Um, from PAIU, we have several innovations that have come out, and I have those listed here on the slide for you. And one we're going to see later today is the, the PAIU hub that's on OER Commons, something that we are all really proud of. Another one is our, our lead on podcast with Greg and Mark, two of the executive directors of two of our IUs. And then, of course, our Pete and C Expo, which is the Pennsylvania Education Technology Expo and Conference that we hold every year, where we pull all of our educators together from the state and we talk about the latest innovations in educational technology and help educators to know how to bring that into the classroom. We wanted to give you a little bit of a timeline of how we've begun to talk about OER in the state. And that went all the way back to 2015 with the Federal Go Open Initiative when that first started under the Office of Educational Technology. Um, we had two PA districts that actually participated in that initial Go Open round. Um, and they're still doing active OER work to this day. When that started happening, rumors started spreading across the state. What's this OER stuff? What's going on? And because districts were starting to talk about it, several of our IUs said, hey, what's going on? And we started coming together to say, we need to learn about this. We need to see where the resources are. We need to start vetting them. And in 2016, we found that OER Commons was the most useful site to go to to find resources and that it aligned with our vision for how to best support districts in implementation. So in 2017, one of our statewide job alike groups, which is the PA Instructional Media Specialists or PAMES, we really love acronyms in PA. I'm sure you all know that we love acronyms in education in general. But our PAMES group actually began talks with ISKME to develop our PAIU hub, and it's been operational ever since then. In 2018, another thing that you're going to see during this presentation was we began work on the PA STEM toolkit, which became one of our first statewide work groups through the PAIU hub. And our focus there was to have PA core and academic standards brought into the hub, finding resources that could be aligned to the standards through the PA STEM toolkit so that we could have a collection of PA aligned STEM centric resources for teachers that teachers were involved in creating. As we've continued that work, now we're at the point where we're starting to focus our work on the OER DEIA action plan that came out of the K-12 Voices for Open group through the Go Open Network. And we're working on helping K-12 district implementation through that guide and also how to align that to the initiatives for STEELS implementation moving forward. 
So now I'm going to turn it over to Tracy so she can talk a little bit about the PA STEM toolkit. Thank you, Becky. And I apologize, my internet became unstable, so I'm going to leave my camera off. Um, as Becky was saying, uh, in 2018, work be began on the PA STEM toolkit. The PA instructional, instructional media specialists have branched out and we really have become much more than just instructional media specialists. Um, one of thing, one of those things is we have a lot of the the STEM POCs within our instructional media specialist group. Um, working with ISKME to have the PA core and academic standards added to OER Commons has been fabulous for our STEM toolkit. We have that group of teachers, STEM POCs, and OER Commons all vetting these resources as they get in, in put into the, the STEM toolkit. Um, we have a bunch of different sandboxes in there that are still in the process of being vetted, but it's fantastic. And this all goes along with the Pennsylvania Department of Education's vision, mission, and belief um, for STEM education. Anything else you'd like to add, Becky? No, I think that's great. The biggest thing I think is the collaboration that goes into it. And Demetrius, you can chime in on this too, because I know you've had some work with it. But the way you see that group meeting together regularly throughout the year to look at resources together, to talk about them, it really is a very collaborative process. It's not siloed off at all. Teachers come together, they look at a resource, they say, what works for them, what might not work for them. And they know that it's a personalized experience. So a resource goes into the toolkit knowing that it meets all the criteria that the group has established, but it may not always be a perfect fit because resources can be subjected from classroom to classroom. And that's okay. There is an overall understanding that resources will work in some contexts and may not work perfectly in others. So they do have that overall understanding of that. Demetrius, anything that you want to add to it? Um, I think the you know the the biggest thing I wanted to share was um looking at that timeline, and I'm not sure where everyone um on the call currently is from, um, but one thing I think to note here in Pennsylvania, which is um, why we have this approach, and and our Pennsylvania Department of Education, you know, have an office of technology or an Office of Educational Technology. Um, we have a, a off, Office of Curriculum, um, an Office of um, Secondary and Elementary Education. Um, however, there's not a lot of specialists around what's happening in technology. And so really, in Pennsylvania, our Department of Education really leans on the intermediate unit system to fill that void. And so we play that pivotal role in picking up the pieces around the technology needs for the state through the work of the job alike group for instructional media services. So it really is a bigger, bigger branch than it may seem on the surface. Um, once you realize that we are really working to fill a void that we currently don't have um, in our Department of Education. Um, and so this really is a, a statewide approach. Um, and one of our missions is to grow that awareness piece that we talked about with, with low awareness, um, but to really create an easy strategy and a low cost entry point for all of our 500 plus um, individual LEAs uh, who get to do what they want in the land of uh, choice, uh, you know, local control, I should say, here in Pennsylvania. Thanks, Demetrius. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about the steel standards, since this really is your domain? Yeah, yeah. So I, it's it's really shared, and I get to really pay, play a um, the role of conductor when it comes to our the rollout of our steel standards. Um, so over the past few years, um, started out um, toward the end of the pandemic, um, we really worked to update our science. It really started out as science standards. Um, here in Pennsylvania, we have we did not move to NGSS um, at the same time as some other states. 
And so we started um, working toward that process. And about 2020, 2021, um, there was a lot of groups come together via on, you know, online Zoom and Teams um, that worked together to establish a framework for what um, updated standards would look like. Uh, and here in Pennsylvania, we really came out with the need to develop the focus around science, technology, engineering, um, standards and environmental literacy and sustainability standards. One thing to note, the big, I guess, connection, just kind of jumping, um, is the standards are built around NGSS. So there's parts of the standards that are almost identical as NGSS. Maybe the colors have been changed around a little bit. But there's other parts of the standards in terms of our technology and engineering standards, which are completely different from NGSS and even maybe look different from the traditional three-dimensional framework that NGSS is built in. And then we have environmental literacy standards, which have been designed to be 3D, three-dimensional like NGSS, uh, but really have a different flair to it all together. Um, and so in PA, this was really an approach that we were able to agree upon across um, our leadership uh, and the community members that we brought together to develop the standards to really move us toward having um, almost STEM like standards when you focus in on the technology and engineering components of the standards. Um, I wanted to start with that conversation about them being built in NGSS um, just by show of uh, digital thumbs. Uh, those are in your, the call. How many of you on the call are familiar with? three-dimensional teaching and learning um, related to um, NGSS standards. I'm gonna need digital thumbs, see if my do it by itself. No, no, no digital. Okay, so if you're not familiar with three-dimensional teaching and learning, and in, in the, the approach with NGSS is to teach a set of standards across um, these three dimensions. The first dimension is around scientific and engineering practices. So the other things like um, developing and using models, which is a, a, a concept, um, planning and carrying out investigations. Um, and then you have the, the second, um, have the second element of the dimension, which you have these core ideas. Um, that are based in science, like what are wave properties, what are uh, electromagnetic um, electromagnetic radiation. Uh, and then you have this final piece, and this is really the kicker. The, the final piece, the third dimension is cross-cutting. So what are these concepts that are agnostic to, every, you know, agnostic regardless of subject area, such as um, what is structure and function? Um, uh, what are the uh, elements of uh, per persuading someone and understanding a, a content area or understanding a subject area? Um, so you have these these elements, which really require our teachers to work together here in Pennsylvania more than they they've had to probably you know previously under our, our previous standards and what what really pushes the concept of NGSS. So we really see that big connection of, okay, we need to have a support structure for teachers in using high quality materials, which allows students to um, have an inquiry-based approach to understanding scientific pr principles for understanding the practices of how you engage in studying um, a scientific principle. And then, oh my goodness, how are we making the connection between how students are looking at structure and function in math, as well as ELA, um, as well as in the science class, and now in the technology and engineering or STEM class? Um, are they making those connections? And what tools are being used? What frameworks are being used? What resources are being used? And that schools develop these, OER is really a great way to go about this because A, there are schools who are already doing this and there's resources available to everyone. Um, you know, as we're able to search them out, especially for us here in PA using OER Commons. Um, but then how can we support schools in working together to share those resources as they develop them so that we're better together, even though we have a individualistic approach here in PA as we our LEAs have local control 
Um, can we bring our teachers together, our curriculum leaders together? Um, so we're really trying to support a full, a holistic approach and not really um, really take asking schools to be cautious as they um, buy resources to support the rollout of these standards because they're new. They're, they're unlike really anywhere else in, in the country right now. They really bring together kind of three different concepts around um, how standards are formed um, to develop maybe our own version of NGSS. And um, obviously the publishing companies are trying to keep up and, and draw those connections, but we truly believe our educators and our educational leaders have it within them with the tools that are available to identify high quality resources and share them amongst each other um, at a better rate than, than we could probably buy right now, especially when you start incorporating in what AI is able to provide back to us as we're developing our own lessons and resources that can be shared out through a, a open um, a open education resource model. So Demetrius, do you wanna talk a little bit about the implementation training that has been going on across the state and how that does connect with some of the OER conversations that you've been having as well? Absolutely. So um, we've been fortunate here in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I've also had the knowledge of knowing not every state has had a on-ramp to in, implementing new standards. Sometimes I know, depending on where you're from, you, you probably know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you get kind of a one year, here, here's the standards you have next year to have these in your curriculum. Um, we were able to, to engage in a slower rollout, rollout. So our standards were officially approved in 20, uh, 21, 22. Um, and so we've been on this trajectory uh, starting in 22 to um, going into the school year of 25, 26 to roll out the standards. And so we've been working with a variety of partners across um, really the country. Um, here locally, we've been fortunate to engage with Penn State and their School of Education for some support around NGSS. Um, but we've gotten a lot of support from West Ed, um, which has worked with multiple states around implementing the next generation of science standards. And that work right now to support schools has been um, funneling through our intermediate unit system to provide them with high quality professional learning um, and resources that could be turned over to schools to support um, the implementation and the curriculum design uh, of um, to support the still standards um, being designed in the curriculums of our school or schools, excuse me. Um, and so one of the things that has cropped up in that work with West Ed is they've introduced many of our IU leaders who, who are working to lead this professional learning for schools and open educational resources. Uh, we've been introduced to an organization called Open Syed, um, which has really honed in and, and everything I'm talking about around the benefit of a, a shared collective, collective effort to build high quality resources um, and try to get away from buying them. Um, and really leaning on the teachers to develop their own, understand it, and be able to share that um, with each other. So we're engaging in this professional learning. We're using resources from Open Syed, but we also see this learning that we are receiving from West Ed. Um, and as we're using these the Open Syed resources that here in Pennsylvania, with our partnership that we already have with uh, with um, or with PAIU. Um, and working with ISKME, that we have it within ourselves to, to model that and have our teachers develop their own resources that will be based in these standards, which um, cut across multiple areas, then you would traditionally see where the national resource that's built just in NGSS, our standards have more focus areas. And um, we're able to customize that here in Pennsylvania and, and have schools customize it to their own community needs. So that work is really taken off and we're hoping to strengthen that connection. Again, as schools are looking for those resources to support these new standards, how can we help districts develop their own resources and share them so that we're better together? And Demetrius, if, if I have this correct, because it my intermediate unit, I am not the person that's doing the direct implementation for this. Um, the training that is occurring First of all, the standards, it's K to 12. So science, the new steel standards that's going out K to 12. The training is happening 
for all teachers, all science teachers now K to 12 as well across the entire state. And the training, because there's that strong focus on OER, and they are explicitly talking about resources such as Open Syed, we are now explaining to all science teachers across the entire state right. what OER are, how they can be used to support teaching and learning. So to Amy's point earlier, when we heard about these statistics about OER awareness at the K to 12 level, only being at maybe about 25%, maybe this training can kind of help to elevate those numbers a little bit and turn them from just awareness to use and application now. Correct. That is certainly to help. And I guess I, um, sorry, I got excited and I skipped ahead. My, my favorite part of the whole science approach is really um, engaging more than just the science teachers mm -hmm. uh, and standards work when you factor in the need for the, the concepts to be cross-cutting. And so we're certainly addressing all science teachers in the Commonwealth and targeting them for the training that the IUs are providing in their each of the regions. But one of the things I am seeing is that um, sometimes there are more than just the science teachers attending. Um, we see a fair amount of math teachers that are saying, hey, maybe I need to know about this. Um, and we're also seeing some ELA teachers attend as well, um, because uh, as we all know, most of our standardized tests are ultimately ELA tests um, in some form or fashion. They, they require students to be able to, to understand what they're reading and, and understand how to respond. And so there's a lot of cross-cutting concepts across those three areas. And of course, um, you can focus in on other areas as well, but those three seem to be having um, those departments say, I should understand a little bit more about this, or um, let me take a look at the resources you're looking to see how we can connect um, our persuasive writing unit to um, some of the work that you may do you may be doing um, as related to these new standards. So broader implications for awareness beyond just science. Hundred percent, yes. That's incredible. Yes, that's to to me. I believe really that's the only way. Um, I know there's some barriers in between. I don't want to bring them up on this particular call uh, of why maybe schools aren't moving fast enough. Um, but we really see that that's what the call is because um, if you go through the standards, it's a lot. It's it's really three main areas. And the expectation for one teacher and one one class to hit all those standards on a, on any given grade level that the standards are designed for really is improbable. And so it has to be a shared approach within the school system in which multiple teachers are seeing the content areas that they teach and the scientific approaches as part of the standards. They have to see it as part of their work um, to help students understand how really all connects and why um, math, science, reading, speaking, writing, the social element, um, they all play a role in helping the students holistically understand um, what we're trying to get them to do with the scientific practices and be obviously at the end of the day, um, quality um, adults and, and able to be employable. But yes, the implications are, are bigger and larger than just science. And really be, be, we believe to make that happen, you have to have high quality resources. And we ultimately believe that they should be designed by teachers locally and teachers should be supporting each other with those resources, not just in individual school buildings or individual districts, but across districts, across at least our state, if not beyond. And so this training is now going to also provide us a, a mechanism to help them to be able to collaborate on a bigger level, not just classroom to classroom within their own buildings, but statewide. Statewide with the systematic approach. Um, and systematic means that it could live on beyond any of us as things change or teachers change role is not going to be stuck with a great teacher who was able to do a good job alone. Those resources could be impactful um, from one great teacher to another that may be at opposite ends of our commonwealth. I love that. If I could add to this, it's uh, so fascinating that you're coming at it from a top down with all the partnerships and then bottom up as well, supporting teachers 
in this learning of new standards. I just want to raise up a question. Uh, Saul from Oregon is asking about buy-in. And I'm just curious if the level of buy-in um, in, in the IU level is happening um, because there's, you know, buy-in across the state uh, or, you know, or a, a, perhaps uh, through this type of training that teachers can get exposed to OER, even if their IU hasn't created its own OER implementation strategy. I'm just wondering where you're seeing the challenges to bring along IUs that haven't gotten started or uh, if, how your strategy is working with buy-in. That's uh, a great question. Um, I think holistically, we have buy-in in terms of concept. Um, many of us, many of the people leading this work in, from the IUs um, are also the same people who do the work of STEM. And prior to any of this work with standards and um, the reason why we developed the STEM toolkit is really because ultimately we believe that that um, that cross-curricular approach is really the best thing for our learners. And um, the design of the standards and the teams of people that work to develop them try to capture that. Um, and that's why you see kind of those three focus areas within our standards. So in theory, there's a great buy-in. Um, there are some barriers. Some of the main ones would, the main one would be our state testing um, strategies. Um, are not quite matching the standards just yet. So some people are saying, well, do I, you know, do I really need to make this change if the test is going to look the same? Um, and so there is some some hesitancy around buy-in, you know, per LEA, per leader saying, we believe you, we are and on this, we do think this is the best thing for kids, but maybe this doesn't have to be our number one priority, knowing, you know there's not gonna be a major shift in the test in 25, 26. That's gonna happen a little bit more slowly over time. And then related to the OER project, um, I think that's giving some room for people to say, okay, we hear you on this stuff, um, but maybe it can be the third thing on our priority list for this year. And we'll maybe start to gear up for this change next year or the year after next when our science curriculum wrote, um, science curricular you know, rotation is up um, to work on it. We don't need to prioritize it now. So we do recognize that those are some of the barriers. Um, however, I think the general consensus is a belief that this is a way we need to go. Um, and again, I think AI, I mentioned AI, I think it's helping, it's illuminating, like we have to make these changes. We have to drive kids as um, leaders of their own learning because the, the tools that they have available with them, um, they're asking questions, right, around why they have to do certain things certain ways if realistically they're, they don't need to know certain certain pieces of um, information. And so those things are challenging the approaches and they're actually helpful, um, which we're saying exactly. And we're saying, this is how we should be teaching science. And this is what your resources would look like. And oh, by the way, Here's some resources for open sci ed that are exemplars for what it looks like for students to have um, assessments that they can't chat GPT, which is, you know, to be really honest, it really requires them to be thinkers and, and um, understand what it is that they're saying and articulate it locally to what they're, what they're studying, the phenomena that they're interested in. Um, and so in that way, it is, it is bringing awareness uh, around open sci ed um, and it's bringing awareness that as they schools make this shift, um, maybe we should be thinking about how we can work with other districts, or is it a way that we can see how people are making this shift? Because I'm thinking this might be a heavy lift um, to to incorporate these new standards. They cut across other areas in our curriculum, um, our, our curriculum rotation model. So I would say overall there's buy-in, um, but yeah, I, I would, I would not be truthful if I said said there didn't mention that there was some hesitancy um, from some of our leaders. And fair enough, I, I put myself in the shoes of a superintendent um, who may be dealing with multiple, um, you know, areas of change 
and I can understand why someone might put this second or third on their list. It's number one in my world, but I can see how <laughs> they take precedent in, in some of our LEA and some of our regions of our state. Great. Thank you. I hope that answers uh, the question from, from our um, attendee. Uh, I'll I'll let you go, but it, it just you you have many arguments here that could help other districts and other states um, make that uh, that plea to their district leaders to take on this work because because OER fits with things that you're already doing. It's not meant to be an initiative on its own. Exactly. Thank you. And because it's not supposed to be just something that you do on its own, we have made a very intentional effort to wrap OER implementation into as many instructional initiatives as we can when we work with our districts, when we talk in our job alike groups, when we are interacting with individuals at PDE and talking at state levels. So I wanted to put this slide together so we could kind of talk a little bit about what things look like at the state level and, and how things operate. PDE has a, a wonderful site called the Standards Align System or SAS. And this is their one-stop shop for all of their guidance and resource and materials that they develop and push out across the state anytime there's new initiatives, anytime there are new mandates. There is a great steels hub on here with all kinds of resources to help get people started. This is where PDE goes. Teachers, however, tend to go everywhere to find resources that they can use in their classroom. That's why PAIU and PAMES went to OER Commons to build the PAIU hub. So this is where the PAIU hub lives for us because this is more classroom centric for a lot of things. In the SAS system, you are definitely going to find all of your curriculum framework documents. You are going to find the standards alignment documents. You are going to find all of the nuts and bolts, the what do I need, the how do I implement, the why do I need to do this. It is all absolutely there. Those technical components don't always exist in the PAIU hub. So you need both systems to exist. They both serve a purpose. But the classroom boots on the ground work is in the PAIU hub. So I wanted to show how both of them serve a function for educators across the state. When it comes to the PAIU hub, every single intermediate unit has the opportunity to have a group within the hub and we all have resources in there. I featured all of our intermediate units because we are all active members on the PAIU hub and we all have several resources. Tracy's really prolific on there. She has tons and tons of resources that she's used. I know she gets all kinds of tracking data for her resources. People as far as Texas have been using her resources and reaching out about them. She's amazing on there. Um, Westmoreland Intermediate Unit has some, and all of these um, images throughout this entire presentation are linked so you can go and you can dig in. Um, but we use these all the time to share out resources with our districts, to share out with resources with our sister intermediate units across the state. This is where we go when we have training resources, when we're trying to work on new initiatives with our districts, when we have guidance that might not make sense to put in SAS site because it's something unique to us or unique to our districts, this is where we're going. We have our hub for this specific purpose. And Tracy has been a huge advocate of doing state level work for Open Ed Week every year. And she has an entire group on Open Ed Week that I know she wants to talk about, especially because it's going to align to a lot of the work that we've been doing with steel standards and STEM. I do, thank you, Becky. Um, Open Ed Week is one of my favorite things that I get to participate in every year um, through the OER committee, through PAMES. Um, we decide on a topic relevant to the year to focus on, and we create asynchronous professional learning within the OER Commons platform. Last year, we identified accessibility in UDL as a topic of interest. I know it has one of the questions mentioned accessibility. 
Um, the, that resource includes um, information from experts in the accessibility community, including CAS and the National Center on Accessible Educational Materials. This is a great start for those who are ready to adapt materials to meet the needs of all students. So I hope that answers a little bit of your question above about accessibility. We try very hard to make sure that we provide as much professional learning on that as we can. So everyone knows how to create their materials already accessible and they don't necessarily have to adapt as much. Um, this year, the spotlight will be on the implementation training of the steel standards and STEM um, and hopefully you can join us. It's a it's a pop up conference that we do, and it's just it's a it's great for me. I love it. Our group has increased. Um, we're over a hundred members now, and over the last couple of years, and it's just been fantastic to see the comments in there. Thanks, Tracy. And so that's it. That's a little bit about our, our journey and, and what we've been doing across the state to help. Demetrius, Tracy, any final thoughts before we open it up for any last questions? Okay, Amy, I'm going to turn it back to you then. Great, thank you. I was going to uh, also supplement some of the uh, materials that we have uh, on the Go Open Hub about accessibility. If if folks need that link, we can get it to you. It, we have a whole collection. There's over 300 items about the topic of accessibility, about understanding how to make materials digitally accessible uh, for users with disabilities and for users with different types of learning preferences. Uh, ISKME also created what is a STEM OER framework and guide. Uh, it was designed first for higher ed, but it, it really does apply to um, to any subject, but particularly for STEM OER that can be evaluated and adapted in the areas, particularly around materials that need mathematical formulas or chemical equations or data sets or maps or illustrations, all these uh, particular parts of resources in the STEM area need special attention for accessibility. So that link that I put in the chat um, addresses some of that. I um, really recommend digging into it if um, that's your area. And um, what I, I was going to ask uh, is, is just, you know, from the audience, if you want to unmute, just jump right in or put a question in the chat. Uh, what had come up for me um, as you're talking, uh, and thank you so much for this presenting such uh, a system-wide implementation. It's really happening on, on all levels. And this um, gradual on-ramp of new the new steels uh, standards, that seems like, um, you know, just, an invitation for for teachers not to have to bear the burden uh, to to switch to OER, change standards, and change their teaching practices all at once. It, it sounds like uh, it's um, a practice changing effort that will have a lot of supports and ways of of getting there without being uh, you know a shock to the system. So um, if you want to comment on that, or or, or folks want to ask questions. I see your chat, Demetrius. Educators will be able to design resources quickly and adapt them more efficiently with help of AI in, in the years from now. AIs will be able to, you know, I've been thinking about how much AI might be um, a tool in adapting OER. And uh, I don't know if you've had any, uh, you know, experience with that to that you want to highlight or if it's just a whole new area for exploration. 
Yeah, I mean, me personally, I've been playing around with it a lot to help me draft even um, the frameworks for professional learning that I offer, which is really just another type of lesson planning or curriculum resource. Um, and I, I imagine that I've been hacking AI to help me reuse, remix, um, you know, other ideas out there kind of on my own, just using my own, um, the way I'm using chatbots. But I imagine that, you know, there's only a matter of time. Like, you know, most platforms are figuring out how to add some sort of AI API into the platform. So I imagine there's only, a, you know, a matter of time before our OER platforms have an AI API that's able to um, curate research or questions through those those resources and being able to help educators um, a not only identify curricular resources that are available across OER platforms, but then maybe to customize that to their own context. So I've done all sorts of things like tell my OER what my standards are. Okay, now you know here's my goals. Here my here are my standards. Here's where here's my objectives. And I'm looking to do X, Y, Z. What kind of lesson plan can you draft for me? Um, and it does pretty well right now with just what's on the internet from 2000 and what's 21, right? So I can only imagine once it starts connecting some of our, our systems to be able to better carry um, information that um, is going to be a powerful tool in the hands of our educators when used right. You better trademark that idea right now because this is recorded <laughs> and then published. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cameron, For uh, thanks for your comment that there's a lot of new educator AI sites coming out every week, it feels like. Um, and yeah. OER really needs to be part of this because of its adaptability and, uh, you know, not to uh, lose our ability to, to uh, evaluate things for quality and relevance and being up to date and being accurate because uh, we know that um, sometimes AI goes awry and it, it's not accurate information. So um, I think this will be just an, another tool in our, our toolbox for making the best materials out there. Absolutely. And I think that's really the key for anybody that's feeling a little apprehensive about using OER in the classroom, using AI in the classroom, using any emerging technology. Um, is that you have to remember that there's always a human component to this and that a large part of our job as educators is verification. Whether you're using a textbook, whether you're using a digital resource, whether you're using something that someone has created, it is your job as an educator to look at the content in front of you and to verify its accuracy and then to make the judgment call as to whether that resource is appropriate to use in your personal classroom. Will it work with your set of students? So you have to have that human connection to what's going on and to the resource to determine whether or not something is going to work for you. So all of these technologies, all of these resources, they aren't as scary as you think about they the, the, they could be when you really think about the critical role that humans will play in them. They can actually be really inspiring and and really fun to try out remembering that you are the safety net, you are are the one that makes the judgment call for what's gonna work and what's not. That's great, Becky. And that goes to the point you often make that this work is about trusting your teachers, trusting mm -hmm. teachers that they are gonna bring their expertise and their judgment and assessment of what's the right thing for their classroom. That's great. We have maybe uh, a minute or two left. If there's any other questions, I, I was just wondering if, in this rollout, has the Pennsylvania team noticed any gaps in particular uh, in subject areas that don't have OER yet? And if there's anything that comes to mind, Ooh. like with the environmental literacy, or is this are these really kind of newer areas for building OER? That's a great I would question. say it's newer for us. We've had the STEM toolkit, which is broken out to some of these areas, but I think the new standards are requiring a little bit more detail in terms of content area um, and what really we're looking to challenge teachers to help their students learn. 
And so it's growing slow. People are still processing it. Um, so I, I would expect this to just increase over time. And I would say probably we're a little bit most behind if I had to pick an area on our technology and engineering mm. standards. Really just, it's a grand problem that we have. Yes, we all have a teacher shortage, but here in Pennsylvania, we graduated two students last year with technology and engineering certifications. Um, and, you know, the average per year is, um, it hasn't been more than 10 in, in multiple years. So um, it's something we're asking our elementary teachers to do, but we know our elementary teachers haven't gone to school to learn technology and engineering. And so how are we providing professional development for those teachers to be able to you know, fulfill those those that gap? So it's a slow growing area and it is a grand challenge that we all have amongst us which is why in our rollout, we're really trying to up our IU staff to have expertise in those standard areas to be able to support all their, their, their schools in catching up. And that's also part of the long on-ramp that we've had here three years to roll out standards because we recognize that there's a huge knowledge gap across what teachers learn in college, what they have taught. And then we're asking them about fulcrums and other really high level engineering concepts to teach the kids at varying levels. Yes, thank you for that. It's a big topic for the the, our, the last minute of our web, webinar, sorry. And mm -hmm. let me put up our last slide because we would love you to stay in touch and to get more into the Go Open network, to also get in touch with um, PAIU and their hub the STEM toolkit. There's great STEM resources coming out all the time to answer uh, teachers' needs and to be evaluated. And we'd love to hear from anyone that's that's here. But one thing you can all do is let another colleague know about OER and go open if they don't yet know. And that's how we'll build this, this systemic change. So thank you for being here. Thanks, everyone.